Um, good morning, urbanists. Um, thank you, Sam. Uh, thanks for uh, inviting me to uh, speak today. So um, today I would like to traverse a set of ideas regarding cities and their relationship to violence and peace. To understand the city in relation to questions of violence and peace, it is useful to consider how military cultures typically think of the city. To quote a writer named Bill Millard, warrior castes and guerrilla movements in nation after nation have defined themselves in terms of rustic purity, in contrast to the heterogeneity and hedonism found in urban centers. So for instance, the Wahhabi nomad, Nazi Judeophobe, and Maoist cadre all share a tendency to view cities and their residents as decadent, polluted, effeminate, and probably in need of some cleansing fire. Geographers and historians, ge geographers, historians, and architects increasingly use the term herbicide to describe acts of violence that are specifically aimed at the physical structures of the city and its social milieu. An example of herbicide is the Khmer Rouge's treatment of all Cambodian cities, but most famously, or sorry, infamously, Phnom Penh. Here, um, you can see Phnom Penh in the early 1970s as a bustling metropolis. In 1975, the Khmer Rouge forcibly removed all residents, leaving the, site, leaving the entire city deserted. Under Pol Pot's regime, Cambodians were divided into two classes of people, what were called old people and new people. Old people were the more trusted rural inhabitants, and new people the former city inhabitants, their very cityness qualifying them for extra suspicion, scrutiny, and ultimately disposability. In what could be called the tragic poster child of herbicide is Sarajevo at the hands of militant Serbian nationalists. Despite the cliches of balkanization, Sarajevo functioned as an exceptionally pluralistic city for centuries. Its physical form, that of ethnic enclaves radiating around uh, a central collective shared market space, has been described by numerous scholars as an embodiment of intercultural exchange. But from 1992 to 1996, it was systematically destroyed in the longest siege of any capital city in modern history. Locations that served as mixing chambers for different ethnicities, places such as cafes, markets, and, lab and libraries were specifically targeted, and often in very perverse and nefarious ways. Uh, for example, secret uh, clandestine elevator shafts put into buildings to systematically remove evidence of different ethnic groups um, working together peacefully, harmoniously. So not only would people be murdered, buildings would be destroyed, but you would remove any remaining physical evidence of, of uh, kind of um, ethnic uh, successful interactions. The 9-11 attacks were orchestrated, at least mythically, from the absolute physical other of the city, that of the cave. But they were also orchestrated or also involved professional city makers turned city destroyers. Muhammad Atta, for instance, was an architect and also held a master's degree in urban planning. This is the cover page from his thesis. And in this thesis, Atta argues against the transformative effects of modern urbanization and its damage to traditional Islamic neighborhoods. The high-rise tower is specifically targeted in his academic work, and it is tempting to see within his role in 9-11 at least some literal architectural and urbanist agenda at work. Various scholars have also described the United States military as distinctly rural, both in its geographic locations and ideology. For instance, the US military tends to be populated by people from non-urban environments. These are the 15 states with the highest inscription levels, and they happen to be very low in urbanization. Quite simply, city dwellers tend to enroll in the United States military less. And we often think that has a lot to do with uh, socioeconomic or economic uh, class, um, but there's many studies out that, that uh, demonstrate that the, the belief that people from poorer backgrounds tend to go in the military is actually not, uh, not accurate. 
Um, urban theorist Stephen Graham has identified the anti-urban rhetoric that increasingly pervades U.S. military training and doctrine and the ways it surprisingly approximates some of Al-Qaeda's views on the city. Now, if a consideration of warrior culture ideology conveys its anti-urbanisms, it also suggests its inverse. And this is the critical point, that cities themselves may function as engines of peace. So what to make of this in relation to the fact that we are currently living in the urban age? That in 2007, for the first time in human history, more people are living in cities than in rural settings, with a dramatic worldwide acceleration of dense urbanity from Shanghai to Vancouver. Well, through the work of a range of institutions and individual researchers, it is now coming into focus that we are not only living in an age of unprecedented urbanity, but also of unprecedented peacefulness. For example, the psychologist Steven Pinker, in his uh, recent book that uh, meticulously describes the decline over centuries in violence of all types, murder, rape, genocide, and war. This is a, a graph from his book showing the decline in battle deaths from both interstate and civil wars from 1946 to 2008. This is another graph from the book that um, describes the, um, the, the decline in genocide deaths covering the same period. And I could go on and on and on with examples from this book uh, showing other numerical measurements spanning different periods of time, categorizing different times, types of violence. And then you can grab from various um, kind of non-governmental um, institutions from around the world that convey similar so sorts of data. So, while the reasons for this historically unprecedented peacefulness are, of course, complex and numerous, um, but I would like to suggest that it might not be a coincidence that as the number of people living in cities has increased, violence of all types has gone down. So much so that we might be able to begin to talk about not Pax Romana, Pax Britannica, or even Pax Americana, but through the proliferation of cities throughout the world that we can talk about a Pax Metropolitana, or the Metropolitan Peace. Now, of course, this is not to say that all is well in the city. The story of the urban age is also a story of, the, or also a tale of the proliferation of slums, the decline of truly public space, and the ongoing uptick in the slippery avatars of disciplinary society. But to see clearly the liberating potential of cities as empathic, peace-enhancing devices that can facilitate intercultural exchange between different subject identities, be they ethnic, sexual, or class-based, can influence our decisions on how to design and construct the cities of the future. From this vantage point, and to return to the here and now of Vancouver, a city whose recent urbanism is celebrated worldwide as an example of livability, we should ask ourselves to what degree this livable urban form enables the proliferation of profound differences and there, by necessity, vital but messy exchanges. It is from this vantage point that being livable seems like an awfully low ambition for a city, and one that favors a comfortable but homogeneous social life. We might instead shift our view to ask how Vancouver can occupy a positive productive position within Pax Metropolitana, and here I will conclude. Paradoxically, this is probably a Vancouver that more enthusiastically embraces conflict and antagonism as a necessary component of democratic urban life. As the architect Rem Koolhaas declares in his reflection on urban form that celebrates a proliferation of difference, each city block is an architectural city-state, each so ideologically different that they are not at war, but productively, gloriously, and peacefully, potentially so. Thank you.